5617 for free information. They'll even show you how much money you could save. Again, do not let credit card companies trick you into thinking that you have to pay it all back. Call Credit Associates now for free information on how to get debt-free faster than you've ever thought possible without debt consolidation or bankruptcy. They depend on your success and offer a guarantee so there's no risk. Call 1-800-400-5617. That's 1-800-400-5617. The following program is a PodcastOne.com production. From Hollywood, California, by way of the Broken Skull Ranch, this is the Steve Austin Show. Give me a hell yeah. Hell yeah. Now, here's Steve Austin. All right, everybody, welcome to Steve Austin Show. I am coming to you from the main streets of Los Angeles, California today. My guest for today's podcast is Lacey Von Eric, the youngest daughter of the modern-day warrior in Texas Tornado, Kerry Von Eric, known for his world-class championship wrestling days and, of course, the Texas Tornado during his time with the WWF. And I tell you what, I found out that Lacey lived, you know, about 50 miles from me here in Los Angeles, and I reached out to her and gave her a call. See, she'd want to come by and shoot the breeze about some of the old days. And, uh, you know, her three, four years she spent in the business of pro wrestling and talk a little bit about her family. And she came by, and we sit here and kick it up and shoot the breeze a little bit here on the podcast. And uh, I can't uh, overstate how important the Von Erics were in – influencing me to get into the business of professional wrestling. Uh, if you've heard my story before, and I've told, talked about it many times here on the podcast, you know, I started watching pro wrestling when I was seven or eight years old down there in Edna, Texas with my mom, and we grew up watching Houston Wrestling, which was a Paul Bosch promotion. And my mom went to high school with Dusty Rhodes. She was a, a freshman when Dusty was a senior, and I followed Dusty's career, and I remember seeing Dusty making a pass through Houston Wrestling and – that's when I knew that I wanted to be a professional wrestler. Well, you fast forward a bunch of years from that, after playing high school football, then getting to college. Well, fast forward from that, and all of a sudden I'm playing junior college football in Wharton County Junior College. And upon completing two years at Wharton County Junior College, to pursue football at the next level, I had two options, two full scholarship offers. One, to the University of New Mexico over in Albuquerque, and two, to University of North Texas now. Back in when I went, it was called North Texas State University. Well, I knew that I wasn't going to leave the great state of Texas, so I bypassed on University of New Mexico and becoming a Lobo and went to North Texas, where I became part of the Mean Green Eagles and uh, spent two years up there playing football, trying to get a college degree. I went there as a linebacker. Blew my knee out and uh, missed a lot of games my first year there and then started all 11 games my senior year at weak side defensive end position. That was it for me. My football days were over. I was not good enough to make the next jump into the big leagues. During my stay at North Texas State, that whole time I was in the Denton area, whether I was going to college or whether I was working on the freight dock for Watkins Motor Lines, a lot of times, you know, me and my buddies would load up and go down to the sportatorium. And, man, we'd get drunk, drink beer, and throw stuff at the wrestlers. You know, wad up our, you know, wax paper cups and popcorn containers. And, you know, that's what you did. You threw stuff at the heels that had heat. And, you know, after all these years of me being a pro wrestler, I don't recommend you throw anything at the wrestlers anymore. Just boo as loud as you can if someone has heat with you. So, anyway, uh, a big part of those trips going down to the Sportatorium on Friday nights, and many times I would go by myself on Saturday mornings while they did the TV taping, man, it was all about the Von Erics. It was all about the Von Erics fighting the Freebirds. you got to understand, now, when I was uh, in that Dallas area, it was starting around 1986 through 1990. So, Technically, the territory was kind of on a decline, but it wasn't in the toilet yet, but it was going downhill. And several key figures had already died. I believe you know David had died, Gino had died, and uh, then Mike died. And I actually got a chance to work a program you know, with Chris Von Erich, uh, with Percy Pringle, who's no longer with us. And, you know, the Von Erichs and the Freebirds were probably one of the, the biggest feuds in the history of pro wrestling and one of the greatest feuds in the history of pro wrestling. And, man, I tell you what, uh, man, I was kind of a heel fan back then because, you know, everybody hated the Freebirds, or you loved them if you loved the heels. And I kind of hated them and loved them. And I looked up to Michael P.S. Hayes as just being one of the greatest talkers, entertainers, and heat-getters in the history of the business. 
And of course, Terry Bam Bam Gordy was just awesome as the big heater, Buddy Jack Roberts, you know, the guy that was just tougher than a cockroach. And everybody thought they could kick his ass. But everybody was behind the Von Eric brothers, man. Kerry and Kevin and that whole Von Eric family, but they were really around when I was there. To put it into perspective, I got a chance to have a run as Stone Cold Steve Austin. I got a chance to see, you know, watch Hulkamania at its peak. I got a chance to see Ric Flair during his peak days. I got a chance to, you know, have my run as Stone Cold Steve Austin. But, man, I'll tell you what, man, if you were around in Texas and many parts of uh, the United States of America, if not the entire United States of America, because of the numbers they were doing were through the roof, they were so crazy, and their TV was being bootlegged all over the world, you have to understand how hot the Von Ericks were. God dang. I've Again, I've seen white-hot crowds. I've seen monster pops and stuff like that, but... If you weren't around during those days, and a lot of you weren't, but if you get on YouTube and watch some of their stuff, you see how over those guys were. And I remember I was watching the, the, the rise and fall of the triumph and tragedy of World Class Championship Wrestling before I talked to Lacey on the WWE Network, and I was watching some of those matches with the Freebirds and the Von Erics, and there was an interview with the Freebirds, and they said, hey, man, you know, pretty much it was a deal where, hey, don't try to break my teeth out and don't try to break any bones in my face. But other than that, I mean, it's full on. I mean, those guys were damn near having a street fight every single time they stepped into the ring. They were laying their stuff in. I mean, God dang. It was some good stuff, some of the best stuff I've ever seen and some of my most fond memories of professional wrestling. And so driving down there and throwing stuff at the wrestlers, getting drunk, I'll never forget, I was in the crowd with my good friend Robert Webb, and his father was a physics professor at Texas A&M University. And uh, we played football together at Wharton County Junior College, and he ended up in Dallas, just like I did, well, in a Denton area, actually. And uh, Rob and I worked on the freight dock together. We would carpool to work every single day, and we would go to wrestling matches, and me and Rob would be out there drinking beer. And I'll never forget, Kerry was in the ring one time, and Rob gave me the elbow right in my ribs, he goes, man, you ought to get in this business. You're as big as he is. He was talking about Kerry. I was nowhere near as big as Kerry or had the great physique or genetics that he possessed. But Kerry just looked like a Greek god in that ring. And it was watching the Von Erics. It was growing up a fan of the business all my life. My buddy poking me in the ribs, talking about Kerry Von Erich, who was a god, and so was Kevin. And that's when I said, you know what? I'm done playing college football. I'm not going to play at the next level. I'm burned out on, you know, research papers and writing stuff for English. I needed 17 hours to graduate. You know, maybe I should pursue this. And I was working full-time at the freight dock. And uh, I was watching TV one night, and I saw a commercial for Gentleman Chris Adams Wrestling School. And I'll tell you what, at that point, that's when I decided... I need to go down and talk to that guy and see him about what it takes to be a professional wrestler and how I get started. I dressed up on Saturday, the morning of the television tapings, had some black jerbo pants, had some black loafers, I had a purple Izod shirt, and I had long blonde hair down in the middle of my back, and I was all jacked up. Just got finished playing football at North Texas. I was in really good shape, 23 years old. And I'll never forget, the TV taping was over, and the people were coming out of that building, a lot of the wrestlers were going to their cars, and there I was in a line of about maybe, I don't know, 40, 45 people. I think by the time it was all said and done, 25 of us joined, 30 maybe. And I went in there and listened to Chris Adams, gentleman Chris Adams, give his spiel about what it was going to take to be a pro wrestler. And, you know, just because you were a football player at North Texas doesn't mean you're going to make it. And he kept singling me out specifically because I was the guy in there that had a look. You know, I, and it turns out, you know, I, I made okay. I did, I did good at uh, the job. But I'll never forget, he called me out so many times. I said, hey, man, you keep saying that if you're a football player, it doesn't mean you can actually do this. I said, man, if you just show me how to do this stuff, I can do it. And he, he looked at me with that English accent. He goes, okay, Steve. Well, the school costs 1500 bucks. Uh, I joined up. I paid $45 for the seminar that day. I don't think I ever settled up with Chris Adams. I probably paid him about $1,000 of the $1,500. 
and we worked a program together. And uh, I ended up winning Rookie of the Year for 1990 for Pro Wrestling Illustrated. And it was because of the high-profile feud with gentleman Chris Adams, and that's how I got my start. And so it was going to the Sportatorium all those days, all those nights, Fridays and Saturdays, and watching the Von Erichs and the Freebirds, and those some of my favorite moments in the history of the business, the storylines that they were telling, the action that they were putting on, uh, the way Mickey Grant and the uh, television team were putting the show together, producing it, having the mics and cameras everywhere that they had it, the angles, the um, vignettes that they would do with David Von Erich, uh, with Jimmy Garvin, and was it Precious or Sunshine, uh, doing all that stuff. And it just made those characters larger than life. And they were doing stupid numbers. I mean, stupid ratings way back in the day. And it's just a testament to how popular that product was. And if you can get on, I think the WWE Network bought a big part of that library from Kevin Von Erich. But if you can get on there, if you want to see some good stuff, I know it's 2017 now, and the business is kind of advanced, you know, athletically with the in-ring stuff. But if you want to see some badass matches or just some great old-school professional wrestling stuff that was just – a cutting edge for its time period. That stuff from the mid-'80s and world-class championship is almost as good as it gets. I was a big fan of Mid-South and Power Pro done by Bill Watts, you know, right down the road in Tulsa, Oklahoma, with Jim Ross doing the play-by-play. -play. But Bill Mercer was just lights out on the horn, and then here comes Mark LaRanche after they, you know, shut Bill down. Bill Mercer was unbelievable. And just the Von Erichs, period, were – a big influence, a big reason why I got into the business of pro wrestling. And all of them are gone. All of them are dead, except for Kevin, who's in Hawaii. I'd love to talk to him one day. Right now, I think he's still in India wrestling with his sons, Marshall and Ross. But I reached out to Lacey. And I said, hey, man, you want to come talk for a little bit? And I think it's, I think it's hard for her to actually talk about a, a lot of uh, things that happened. Well, one, she was really young when all this happened, and uh, she was born in 86, and her father, Kerry, committed suicide in 1992. So she was only six or seven years old. Uh, there was, wasn't a great relationship between Kerry and his wife at the time. So, you know, she kind of grew up fast. And, uh, you know, digging back, a lot of the memories are a little painful for her. So we kind of just have a loose conversation and shoot the breeze. I'd look forward to talking to her again. She's talking about writing a book. The book has already been written. Uh, when uh, and if or that ever comes out. I'd like to shoot the breeze with her again, but it's just a loose conversation talking with Lacey Von Erich here at the house. And uh, again, man, I can't tell you how, how important those Von Erichs were in my career to get me in the business of pro wrestling. I owe a lot to those guys, and they were absolute rock stars. And if you ever want to ask, were, were they over? And this is me, Stone Cold Steve Austin, saying, you damn right, they were over. They were as over as anything I have ever seen. One of the things I wanted to talk about before we get to Lacey Von Eric was the USC Trojans versus the Texas Longhorns football game. God dang, what a classic that damn thing was. Uh, I was recording this game. I had taken uh, my illustrious wife, Kristen, out to eat a hamburger and have a glass of whiskey for my cheat day on my diet. I came back to the house, started watching about the third quarter, and I'd heard those first two quarters were a little bit slow, kind of boring. Man, from the third quarter on, it was lights out. Uh, Clay Helton's done a hell of a job taking over that USC program. Uh, they're on a roll. Number four team, uh, they're the number three team now on Mondays I record this podcast. Texas came in there, just got taken over by Tom Herman from University of Houston. What a, a great offensive mind he is. And they hadn't been doing so good, especially that first game of the year. Coming in to Los Angeles to take on the Trojans, and you figured this might be a blowout for the Trojans. And I'll tell you what, man, those Texas Longhorns gave them hell. Starting from the third quarter on, going into two overtimes, uh, USC, the Trojans finally win it off a, a field goal, uh, second overtime. Just an unbelievable game. And i tell you what, real classy in victory was Sam Darnold. And watching that kid for the first time, I'd been hearing how highly touted he was, and I got a chance to see why. Man, that kid can throw the football with accuracy, go through his progressions, and he's going to be a very high draft pick come, you know, when the draft comes around. And I tell you what, man, he was classy in victory, giving those, uh, that UT team so much credit, uh, the defensive coach a lot of credit, and just talked about how hard those Longhorns played. And then Clay Helton 
said the same thing, uh, very classy, talking about, hey, man, I'm glad we caught those guys early because they're going to be a really, really good team. And, man, I tell you what, man, from that first game to what they look like just this past Saturday here in Los Angeles, it's going to take uh, Tom Herman a little bit of time, but, man, he is the right man for that job. And I think the Texas Longhorns have a bright future with uh, him as a head coach and the, the people that he's put in place. And, man, to that whole coaching staff, y'all played your asses off. And to those guys on the Longhorns team, man, you talk about a damn fight. And uh, it's, I think it's like Coach Herman wrapped up there at the end. You know, if we play this hard, you know, every single time, you know, we face somebody, we got a good chance of winning, and they do. And i uh, tell you what, uh, a couple of years of recruiting the guys that he wants, and he's working with the team that he's got. And, man, there's some awesome players on there. God dang, defensively, Texas was on fire. And Ellinger, God dang, Sam Ellinger came out of nowhere, true freshman. I didn't know anything about this kid. And you talk about composed. And I know, uh, you know, the starting quarterback is out with an injury. He may come back. But, man, I think the future for Texas football looks really, really bright and really, really exciting. So, man, I love the second half of that game. And it was just great to hear the way everybody talks so highly about each other in that game. It's always uh, cool to see uh, great sportsmanship in football. And uh, no politics, nothing but football. Hey, before I get to Lacey Von Eric, one other thing, because I get so many emails about this. I'm going to dedicate an entire podcast to my keto diet. But I get a lot of people asking me, hey, man, what's up with it? What's up with it? Uh, I'm still on my keto program. It's kind of a modified keto diet. I'm eating a higher protein, not, not like a standard keto diet. It's higher in protein, which a lot of people will call foul on that. And they'll say if you're eating too much protein, your body will you know, create that through gluconeogenesis into sugar or carbs. So whatever. Dude, I'm just telling, I'm telling you guys because I get so many damn emails. I'm telling you. I'm on a modified keto diet. I eat high protein. I eat very moderate fat and uh, next to zero carbs. Body weight this morning, after being on this program for several months, I'm at 242. Now, starting tomorrow, I will start incorporating some maintenance carbs back in. So we'll see what my body weight does from there. And after a week or two on the carbs, slow, 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 very low carbs starting off going back in, I'll let you know, you know, how my weight levels. I would expect it to come up just two or three pounds. I'm probably going to stay around the 245 mark. So I basically eliminated for several months, you know, all alcohol, all carbs, other than the stuff that was from my green vegetables. Uh, the key to getting to 242 for me was complete consistency and sticking to the plan, and that's what I did. And uh, when I did that, I knew that I was going to have to eliminate beer, whiskey, and everything else. On my cheat day, I have one drink, and that's with my carbs. And so I'm past that phase right now. I'm a little level off here. So it was a modified keto diet, high protein for me. Yeah, it was probably around 320 grams of protein, give or take 100, I don't know. Uh, I was probably... I don't give my macros out. I think I was I was right around the 2,800 calorie mark. So let's just say that. And when I started this diet a few seasons ago, I was at 288. Past uh, year 265, 70, 74. And uh, really, when I started this, I was probably starting to to lean up a little bit. I probably started at 260. Uh, on my own and then I really kicked in the uh, afterburners and said hey man we need to do our due diligence here and really get to the book and stick to this thing and eliminate all the factors and rely and be specific on first of all what I'm putting in my body second of all how I'm structuring my workouts and my cardio so I never missed one single meal uh, never cheated on one single meal uh, always got my workouts in unless something come up that you know was out of my control I got my, you know, 45 minutes of weights in, and cardio was anywhere from 30 to 60 minutes. And now that I'm at my, you know, goal weight uh, for, for right now, my cardio is uh, a lot of high-intensity stuff. I still do some steady state. I'm basically just mixing it up because I just don't like to do the same thing all the time. So that's what I've done with my diet. I will do uh, a complete uh, breakdown of the keto uh, factor because people are asking, hey man, should I give keto a try? 
my answer is, yeah, if you want to do an experiment, uh, but there's no magic bullet depending on your genetics, and I have average genetics at best. I would say the keto diet worked good for me. If you're able to ingest carbohydrates and lose weight by still eating, you know, 100, 200, 225, uh, you know, grams of carbs, I'd say go lower carb than just go straight up keto, but that's a decision for you to make. Uh, when I do the podcast about my complete keto diet, then maybe you'll, uh, you, you can make that determination for yourself. But, man, I've been around the horn. I've tried all kinds of different diets. This worked for me uh, really well. Once I eliminated all the factors like alcohol and everything else, I probably could have done it on a lower carb diet rather than no carb diet. But I, I chose to go down this route uh, because it's the route I chose to go down, and I got the job done. Anyway, before I move forward with Lacey Von Eric, i got to tell you guys about Dollar Shave Club. Guys, by now you're probably aware that Dollar Shave Club ships amazing razors for just a few bucks. Well, what you might not know is that Dollar Shave Club also has products for all your grooming needs, from body wash to shampoo to hair gel. They got it all. Dollar Shave Club makes it absolutely simple to upgrade your shave and your bathroom with their high-quality products delivered right to your front door. They are changing the game. For a limited time, new members get the Dollar Shave Club starter set for only $5 in your first box. You'll get trial-sized versions of their shave butter, body wash, butt wipes, and their executive razor with an awesome weighty handle and a full cassette of cartridges, again, for just $5. After your first month, replacement cartridges ship automatically for just a few bucks a month. You can only get this offer exclusively at dollarshaveclub.com forward slash Steve. That's dollarshaveclub.com forward slash Steve. Want to know why Attack Each Day was on top of the iTunes charts in its first week? What the hell's going on around here? I ripped my headphones off, spun around, and flinged them. I turn around, and my dad is like three inches from my face. And he said, <laughs> go get them. Gentlemen, we're going to attack this day with an enthusiasm unknown to mankind. Hear Jim Harbaugh, Jack Harbaugh, and JT Rogan share their stories every Tuesday on Attack Each Day, the Harbaugh's podcast on the Podcast One app. Apple Podcasts and PodcastOne.com. This is the Steve Austin Show. I'm rolling sound. I'm here at 317 Gimmick Street for Podcast Studio. Lacey Von Eric just rolled in. How are you? I'm great. Well, Traffic you, sucks, but I'm good. You're drinking over. What can I be drinking? This is Big Wave Golden Ale. It's like it tastes like a lager, but it has a little more flavor. I like so, it. what kind of beer are you into? I stay away from like Bud Lights and things like that. I like uh, like good, like the brew, good brew, like uh, Oktoberfest kind of beers, Hefeweizers. I didn't fancy a beer drinker. Oh yeah, and a whiskey, beer and whiskey. Man, I was, I was sitting there trying to think of a way to frame up this conversation. I was thinking to myself, okay. Here's this young lady. She's 31 years old. She's beautiful. She's got the Von Eric name, uh, third generation. And But when I start doing my research and I'm starting to look at all the dates, it's like it's just a long obituary. Yeah. And I, obviously there's many high spots in your life. And yeah. you're young and you have three kids and everything's going great for you. But along the way, there's a lot of tragedy. Yeah. So That's I was why just, I started wrestling. It's actually why I got into wrestling was for therapy. I was smart. I had my own advertising company. I owned it for eight years. I had 68 employees. Like, I... What, did you go to college? I didn't. But how do you have 68 employees without going to college and you have I made it up. I was a realtor in South Beach at 18. I got my real estate license in two weeks, passed the test. And um, I couldn't get anyone to, you know, let me sell their house. So I made up this credit card type of thing, and I put their, you know, their name and their, um, you know, their business card on one side, and on the other side, I went to all these local businesses and asked them, "You give me five hundred bucks, I'll put a discount in your logo on there, and you'll go to, you know, the entire hospital. Like there's a hospital, and I was like, I'm gonna put it in all of their HR things, so their paychecks, basically, right? right? And it was going to um, thirty thousand people." And I would give it to all thirty thousand if they if they gave me five hundred bucks for that spot. And the realtors paid three grand to be on the other side. And so uh, it was called accent advertising. I just made it up. And, and then I was I did in it South around Beach. The US. Yeah. What the hell were you doing in South Beach? Because you were born in Dallas, right? Yep. Um, I had a boyfriend. Oh God, he was so terrible. He's a bodybuilder. You know, I guess stay away from those guys. I'm just kidding. <laughs> 
Bodybuilders almost like the boys. I mean, when I, when I say the boys, I mean the wrestlers. I yeah, mean, yeah, yeah. I mean that. I mean that. In a, I mean that in a good way. But I mean, there's there's some baggage that can come. Totally, with I that liked lifestyle. him because he looked like daddy, and so I was like, oh, he must be a good guy. No, there's there's only one daddy. So anyway, I ran away from him because he asked me to marry him, and he was so horrible. And I was like, the only way I'm going to leave this guy is if I leave the state. And my girlfriend was a Victoria's Secret model in South Beach, so I called her and I was like, let's. Let's move in together. So I moved into a model's apartment and stayed on a little love seat. Still in Florida? In Florida. This yeah. is in South Beach. So I, I had a one-way ticket and $40, and I became a real estate agent. In two weeks, had someone sponsor me to be a realtor. Went to Douglas Elliman and then started my own company and made all my own money. Got out of there. Had a beautiful, like, penthouse apartment, floor-to-ceiling windows, spent like five grand a month on that and I was 18 years old Jesus <laughs> so then you started getting the wrestling business no so Vince called me one day and I heard I, okay, about okay, this so this I met this guy I really want to start off this question <laughs> I met this guy there in South Beach he, his name was Daniel he was, cheers by the way cheers I'm only going to drink one beer me. with you I'm trying to cut back so I met this guy who had an English accent and a Mercedes and I was like oh yeah Anyway, he got pregnant because he was hot. So you weren't trying to get pregnant? <laughs> no, I was 18. No, I was 19 when I got pregnant. I was 20 when the baby came. Before the market crashes, you find out you're pregnant. Are you happy or oh, yeah. nervous? Oh, no, I was happy. I'm born to be a mom. Okay. I'm so motherly. So the market crashed. I had a baby, and I was like, oh, my God, what am I going to do? Vince calls me, and he's like, do you want to be a wrestler or diva? And I said, Vince, what the hell is a diva? And he goes, it's a girl wrestler. That's what we call them now. <laughs> and so he flew me out, and I was backstage, and, you know, I smelled the bin gay, and it's all the guys taping up, and I was like, oh, my God, this is my childhood. And Flashback. I just, oh, I just started bawling. I was crying so hard, and there was all these radio stations there trying to interview me, and I couldn't even breathe. I couldn't talk. Was it that bad? It was so bad. It was, it, but it, at that moment, I knew that I had held everything inside my whole life. And if I got into the business, it would release all of these horrible, bad emotions that I had inside that I hadn't been addressing. And so I signed the contract that night. But it was How much really... thought did you put into that before you signed it, Lacey? Zero. Zero right. thought. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so when I got there, I never, I did, never paid, a, like, paid a bill. Dan Daniel at, in Miami helped me with that. I never paid taxes. I didn't know. I didn't have a bank account. I didn't have an ID anymore. I lost it. Nothing. So, and I had a baby, and I was single. And they put me in this apartment. It was two bedroom, and they could not give me direct deposit. So they'd give me these checks, and I'd have to. I didn't have a car, so I'd have to rollerblade with my child all the way to like a check cashing spot. And they'd have to look me up on the internet, Lacey Von Eric, to see my name because I didn't have an ID. Needless to say, I was a mess when I'm trying to do developmental. And I had this baby I was taking care of. When you go to uh, the WW Training Center, was that in Orlando or was that in Tampa? It was in uh, Tampa. And, uh, but you only trained for like two months before you had your first match with Natty. Do you think that was uh, the right time? to be in a ring or do you think well, okay. you needed a little so bit more training was, in that it was a little ring in a biker bar so back then okay so i've seen tv now and i've seen what the everyone's going through right now um with training and they it looks all nice they have air conditioning they have tvs and everything like they it's all fancy now where they train where we train was a canning um warehouse with no air conditioning in florida over a hundred degrees no air in the whole place. And we had our practice matches at this biker bar. It was my first match, and I felt like I was ready. But my memory didn't, because whenever I get in the ring, our first spot was Natty had to slap me. And slaps are real, you know? And so, and Natty, Natty just got back from Japan training. So she'd work in snow. She was really strong. And so, anyway, she slaps me, and it's the very beginning of the match, so I forget everything, because I just got slapped in the face. So, she was supposed to grab my arm, go off the ropes, I was supposed to duck her clotheslines, pull the girl her up, or whatever. And so, I go off the ropes, 
That's all I remembered. <laughs> and she went, bam, clothesline you if you don't duck. And um, yeah, I basically just flailed around at that point. I was pretty bad. Okay, so your first match, you go to Biker Bar, you're wrestling Natty, you forget the spot, she slaps the hell out of you. <laughs> but you're not in WWE for a long time. No, okay, so what happened? It was a very happened? short stay. What happened? Before I went to WWE, um, I went to Hermosa, okay? So the market crashes in Miami, I have a new baby, the dad moves to Hermosa Beach. He says, "You should." We're, we're, we broke up before the baby was even born, okay? Because I was like, oh God, I'd never marry you. It was really fun though. So anyway, he goes out to Hermosa and he's like, you got to come here. It's so fun. And I'm like, okay. So, and to anybody that's listening, Hermosa Beach is about 10 miles from where I live. Oh, so it's, it's 10 so miles beautiful. down the road. Okay. Yeah, I love But it's it. in California, just right down the road. Yep. So I uh, go out to Hermosa. So this is right before Vince calls. I met my husband. The second day I arrived, I met the greatest guy I've ever met. Just all into charity, like big brother, big sisters, everything. I was like already in love. And so we were together for two weeks before Vince called, okay? So when I'm out in Florida, I'm talking to him every other day and always trying to fly back out. And they want me to work on weekends, so he's flying out there. Or I'm making up some sort of excuse to come back to California. It was another weekend. They wanted us to work and go go wrestle or whatever. So I came out to California. I, I think I said, like, my grandma died or something. I completely lied because I really wanted to see my husband. So anyway, I came out, and um, I said, I don't think I'm going to go back. Actually, I didn't tell him I was quitting. I told him they're going to give me a break for a couple months because they pay you for, like, three months. Even if you quit, they pay you for like three months after. So I told them, um, they're going to give me like a little break. So anyway, I basically, I just quit and called a them. A little white lie. I don't want to do it. No. Yeah. And so then I, I, I told my husband eventually, oh God, like years later. Because at, at that three months, when the three months was up, I was like, I think I'm just going to get a regular job and not wrestle. Because I just want to be with him. And then we had a baby. We were just a, such a family already, you know. And this was over 10 years ago. And we're still the best family, and now three kids. <laughs> what? Well, but then you decided that you wanted to get out, but then you end up getting back in. So I was working a normal job as a um, I was a designer because I, yeah, I had the advertising company, and so then I was designing ads for um, TripAdvisor. And so I had my normal good job. And then uh, TNA called me after doing some funny Russellicious thing. Have you ever heard of Russellicious? Yes, I have. Okay. So, I, actually, I didn't even know I was doing a show when I did Russellicious, by the way. They called me up one day and said, um, hey, do you want to do a music video? Uh, this is your lyrics. And it was like, hey, I'm Lacey Von Eric. You know the name. My famous from the Wrestling Hall of Fame. A Clawfold's famous. It's not fictitious because Lacey Von Eric gets Russellicious. So, I thought that was really funny. So, I go down the road that day. They give me 1500 bucks to sing this little song. And they tell me that day, hey, um, we're going to go to Florida and do a couple matches. And I was like, for the show. I said, what show? They're like, this is a TV show. And I said, y'all told me this is a music video. And I signed a contract for a music video, I thought. But I actually signed a contract for a TV show. I only went and shot a couple episodes in Florida, and that was it. But it was on TV, and it was online, and everything. So that's where TNA saw me and called. And uh, I was working my job, and they faxed it to my job like a contract to go to TNA. And I was like, oh, it's so, this is way better than WWE because it's like every other week for two days at Universal Studios in Florida. Like, that sounds so fun. How tough could it be? Right. So I quit my job and I went to TNA. And it was the most fun I've ever had in my entire life. And I don't regret one day of it. And that's what happened. So how were you taken into the TNA locker room? Because they put you with beautiful people. Yes, and, and that was difficult at first. Okay, so they open open arms, happy when I get there, right? Well, then it was like a week later. I had a radio interview, and there. It, by the way, when I was at TNA, everyone talked shit about Angelina Love. Everybody, everyone said she was horrible, she was mean, she was this, she was that, and I was like, man, I never want to meet this girl. So anyway, which by the way, we're really good friends. So, and I don't know what they were talking about, but whatever. So I have a radio interview and I'm like, they're like, uh, how do you like Angelina Love? How, are you glad that you're replacing her and blah, blah, blah. 
because she she you know she was being deported. She got deported back to Canada okay, yeah. because of her visa. That's why they brought me in to fill her spot. Gotcha. And so I was like, no, I'm glad I never met her. Everyone hates her and all this stuff. <laughs> and TNA called me and they're like, Lacey, you can't say that. I'm like, y'all said that. <laughs> like, I never even met her. <laughs> So anyway, Angelina comes back a week later. When I get there, she's back from Canada. And I already took her spot, one. And two, I just talked a lot of shit about her, and I didn't mean to, like they did. I see her, and I go, hey, sorry about the internet. (laughs) That was my first words. (laughs) What was her response to, well, you took her spot. She got deported, but then how did you guys become such good friends? Because there's no animosity? No. Or did you work I, through the animosity? And, we worked through it. Yeah. It took a little bit, but I don't give up because, I don't know, I can get along with anyone. I just want to party and have fun with everyone when I was wrestling. That's all I wanted. And so we eventually had a lot of fun together. But was that your expectations out of getting into wrestling business? Because, you know. Honestly, I was just bored at work. I wanted to go back because I was bored. But they had you were married at the time, weren't you? Not yet. Not yet? Nope. We so were things, together four things years at the house, before we got married. So things at the house were good. But Jesus Christ, I mean, you're going back 10 years. You're only 31 sitting in front of me. So then you were 22, 23? Yep. Yeah. So you're still a kid. So yeah. you're, ready, you're still at Red Party, have fun. I'm still ready Drink to have beer, fun. whiskey, and have fun with the girls and the guys. Yeah. But TNA was way different than WWE. It was... Was it structured a little bit differently because... With with WWE and even even at that year that you were around, I mean it's very structured. It's very business oriented. Back when I was there, it was a little bit still wild wild west. You could do a lot of stuff and do things you wanted to do. The structure is pretty carved in stone. Was TNA run a little bit looser, kind of? We could do whatever we wanted. We just had to get there, do our hair and makeup, right. do whatever we want during the day, then wrestle at night. And that was it so fun <laughs> and we didn't see each other as much as the wwe people do when when you see each other that much and you travel together that much it's like being with family you're gonna fight you're gonna get drama or whatever we saw each other every two weeks for two days we were like good friends i mean i wasn't in yet i i had a lot of pushback when i got there they expected a lot from me because i was a von eric and that was really hard on me because it's like I had that little bit of two month training at WWE and now and no training at TNA. So I'm trying to do what they want me to, and I'm not perfect because they're like, You're a Von Eric, you should be perfect at this. Didn't you grow up wrestling? And I'm like, No, I grew up not talking about wrestling because everyone died. Like, why would I talk about wrestling in our family? It's a sore subject. Even when I was a wrestler and called my family that I was going to, some people didn't talk to me. Because wrestling was such a hard, sore subject. They're like, why would you go into a business? Everyone killed themselves in drug overdose. Why would you do that? And I said, I think this is the only way for me to cope with it. Because I had therapy and everything, and it did nothing. Because I didn't want to talk. And I think living the life and being in their shoes and being with the wrestlers and their friends, like Terry or Hulk Hogan and stuff, and Ric Flair, man, he's my childhood, and one of my very good friends now, we still text and talk all the time. He hasn't talked to me since he's been in the hospital, though, um, which I'm worried about. Rick. I talked to him just the other day. You did? How yeah. is he? He's, uh, we were laughing, and he's doing a lot better. Is he still in the hospital, or did he get he out? Was a, he was in a different facility, but he's fixing to go home. Oh, good. Yeah, he's doing good. I talked to him just the other day. Did you worry at all, Lacey, that, hey, man, you know, the business brought a lot of demons out of your dad? Carrie had his demons. Um, yeah, they all or so did. it was rumored. And I wrestled your dad, you know, a few times right before he went to WWF. Wow, you seem too young for that. Well, I was, I was, uh, but this was, this was, uh, I was 24, and just uh, stopped playing football at North Texas State, like your uncle Kevin played. No at. way! My whole family went to North Texas yeah. on my so, mom's side too. Well, if you remember when I was talking to you on the phone, I told you, you know, uh, the Von Erics. For anybody that doesn't know, and almost everybody around the world knows, but the Von Erics. Uh, well, first of all, is one of the greatest family wrestling dynasties in the history of professional wrestling. You know, number one, arguably, and man. I grew up on Houston wrestling down there when I was a kid, watching Dusty and watching Paul Bosch's promotion. And I got a chance to play football at North Texas State, and I was based out of Denton, Texas. 
This is 1986 and 1987. Territory was on its way down. It was really peaking in 83 through 85, and uh, the business was crazy. The Vonics were rock stars. I was just breaking in, and sometimes a guy wouldn't show up on the card. So I'd wrestle Kerry for like five minutes. He'd give me one or two spots maybe, and then they'd put the iron claw on me, and that was it. Same thing with Kevin. You know, one or two high spots, you know, a little bit of heat, and then, you know, iron claw, I'm out. <laughs> So yeah, that was my memory. A lot of times, one time I was going to a spot show, I think it was in Cleburne, Texas. And uh, I'm stopping, I'm getting some gas, I'm driving a 1976 Monte Carlo. And I look over across a gas station, you know, parking lot, and there's this big dude jacked up in a pair of trunks, putting gas in his car. It's your dad, Kerry Von <laughs> Eric, putting gas in his car. I mean, the show's going to start in like two, three hours. He's wearing his, his shit in, in the gas station before he even gets to the building. Oh, so. When you started thinking about getting in the business, or you did, started with WWE, you got out, you signed up for the Russellicious, then you go to TNA. I didn't your know party I signed up for Russellicious. I know, but you got to get lazy. You got to learn how to read the, read the fine print. <laughs> but were you worried, like, hey, man, this kind of led to the demise of a lot of my family members. I need to stay out of this because, no. like you just said, you had therapy. I'm too headstrong. No. I stay away from drugs or anything like that. I just love my beer and I like to have fun. I know how to handle myself. I just, I'm mentally really strong. My dad and my uncles, a lot of people don't know that they grew up in a very tough house. Granddad was not the nicest of dads. What do you remember about Fritz? Well, he was the best granddad in the whole world. And everywhere we went, he'd go, here we is. And so I do now. Um, and, uh, I mean, I remember just growing up on the farm and he would always put us in the buckets of his tractor. And I know like my granddad, right. But my Mimi had told me, you know, who he was divorced from, told me a lot of the stories of how the boys grew up and it's not wrestling that killed them. It really isn't. It was, it was their upbringing and their mental it, that's hard to talk about because I wrote a book about it and um, it's going to be coming out and I it's it's a lot of the secrets and stuff that people don't know about how they grew up and how granddad was to the guys and I know Uncle Kevin if he's listening to this um, would would be really sad and everything to hear that I know the truth about what happened and it's really sad right now I mean like, like again you're, you're 31 now that you processed all this, you went to therapy, you've written your book, it's going to come out. It looks like I said at the beginning of the podcast. For a while, or like when you would make a phone call, y'all would never talk about wrestling because it brought so much misery to your family. With yeah. the glory, it brought misery with all the deaths, with all the drugs, with, with everything that happened. When you look back at everything from, shoot, David, Mike, Chris, Carrie, Jackie was a verse, but that was but way before. Six. Yeah, he was yeah. six. Like, what, what, how do you process all that? Like, was David, was that truly enteritis or was it a, a drug overdose? Did you think, did Uncle David OD or, I mean, that was a rumor? I mean, in, in our family, we consider all of them having drug overdoses and suicides. None of us think that anything was an accident. We just don't. And suicide is hereditary. It, it's a brain, it's a chemical imbalance. And all of the things that happen to them would trigger that. And I, you know, a lot of, a lot of mental problems that people have in society now are not addressed. And I think that in these days, they would have been able to have drugs to cope with them a little better. I myself am on Zoloft because I don't want that to happen to me, you know? And so I, w I wish they had something. I wish they had someone to talk to. I wish they had a drug that was not a bad drug that would help them with their brain and their thoughts and things like that. All right, Lisa, let's take a pause for the calls and thank another sponsor who makes this podcast possible, and that's True Car. Now, there's something about True Car a lot of people don't know, that True Car can also help you find a used car. In fact, there's over 700,000 pre-owned vehicles available from True Car certified dealers nationwide. Now, whether you're looking to buy new or used, True Car gets you upfront pricing information that empowers, letting you see what other people pay for the car you want so you can know what a fair price is and feel 
feel confident. And with True Car, you can connect with a local certified dealer of your choosing to make the process quick and easy. When you're ready to buy a new or used car, visit True Car to enjoy a more confident car buying experience. Some features are not available in all states. And while we're talking about cars, let me take a minute here to tell you about how you can save hundreds of dollars on car insurance. All you have to do is go to Geico.com, and in 15 minutes, you could be saving 15% or more on car insurance. You can finish listening to this podcast, and immediately after, go to Geico.com and get yourself set up. Extra money in your pocket? It may just be the most rewarding thing you do today. Okay, Kevin, for the grand prize of $1 million. What color is the White House? Um, I know this, I know this, I know this. Um, five seconds. Oh, switching to Geico could save you a bunch of money on car insurance? Okay. Judges? That's true, Kevin. They'll allow it. Congratulations. You're a winner. Woo! Geico, because saving 15% or more on car insurance is always a great answer. Hey, everyone, Lillian Garcia here. Make sure you check out my new show, Chasing Glory with Lillian Garcia, every Monday on Podcast One. I'm bringing you the biggest stars in entertainment where we discuss their journey to fame. Dave Bautista helped kick off the show, and since then, we've had WWE superstar Samoa Joe and undefeated boxing champ Layla Ali. Many more of your favorite athletes and entertainers to come here on Chasing Glory. So hit that subscribe button and hang out with me every Monday. The Steve Austin Show. The Steve Austin Show. Hey, what do you remember about the Sportatorium? Because what I remember about that building, it was one of the greatest buildings of all time. I can I never forget it. Pretty dirty. it. Smelled like stale <laughs> Smell beer, like piss, hot dogs, hamburgers, smelled like blood, French fries, sweat, and, and urine. Uh, smelled like French fries and funnel cakes to me. Um, because the French fry man was me and my sister's favorite guy. Do you remember the French fry man? Yeah. He'd like cut them himself, everything. So we'd always hang out with him. He'd help us. He'd let us uh, make French fries. And then do you remember the wall for the kids that you'd go do the fishing rod? Yeah. And you'd, yeah. So I remember that. And then me and the family had to stay behind the cage. Yeah. The crow's nest. Is that what they call it? Yeah. That's what me and Mick Foley called it. I remember uh, I first started and I was a baby face. Like I said, I just got finished playing with North Texas, that long blonde hair, almost like yours, believe it or not. Down the middle of my back, and uh, my brother came to support me, my brother Kevin, and he was the one that would really follow my wrestling career, and we walked in. I was going to get him in for free, which is a big deal when you ain't got no money. And we walked by the uh, the vending area right there, right there when you come in those doors that everybody walked through. And, hell, it was 9 a.m. because we started the show, I believe, at 10, 10 or 11, but we were there early, first guys in the building. And there's a guy behind the concession stands. It was me and my brother. I was walking him to his seat, and the guy goes, Two beers? And my brother Kevin said, God dang. Yeah, two beers. So my brother took the two beers, went and sat and watched wrestling matches. He fell in love with Sportatorium because, because the guy was already selling beer at 9 a.m. in the morning. My brother was hooked. He <laughs> liked to come to Dallas to watch me get the shit kicked out of me. I love it when you blast. have no money. There's always enough for a beer. <laughs> the, that's just the way life works out. <laughs> There's always a silver lining and a dark cloud. <laughs> Are you in contact with your mother? Yeah. I talked to my mom. So she sobered up two years ago. What do you guys uh, do for mm-hmm. holidays or Christmas or anything special? I can't say family or union because, you know, everybody's gone. Well, we have a huge family on my mom's side. Okay. Um, that's part of the family you never hear about because right. it was all the Von Eric boys. Well, and then we have the Simpsons on the other side. My Aunt Barbie married Sean Simpson. Oh. Yeah. And Sean and Steve Simpson. You remember they, that yeah, log, South Good African. looking dude, oh, South so Africa. Cute. And then they, uh, oh man, those guys were over like big time. I'm second to the Von Erics, but they were over. Good looking guys, mm-hmm. baby faces. I heard they got in the mattress business. Yeah, so they just sold it and okay. retired from that. And they live out by the lake, Lake Palestine now. Yeah, and Steve and Sean Simpson. I'll never forget them. So we have it on both sides. Mm. <laughs> and so my Uncle Sean and my Aunt Barbie were kind of like my parents. They lived in one house next to us, and that's where I met, learned all my values, learned how to be a wife, learned how to be a mom, everything from Aunt Barbie and Uncle Sean. And Aunt Pam and Uncle Kevin. Because I was at their house every weekend. Like, they were my other family, for sure. And, uh, yeah, so now Thanksgiving uh, for holidays, we go out to Lake Palestine. They have two lake houses next to each other. And so our family kind of splits up, and we stay in the two houses and have a huge Thanksgiving out there. And then I usually spend Christmas with my husband's family out here. So are you close with Kevin? Yeah. uh, I mean, he lives in Hawaii, so it's hard to see him. Uh, But I talk to him all the time via text and you know, he hates talking on the phone. 
Um, my cousin Jill has been my best friend since I was born, which is his daughter. And so we talk all the time. And she has three little girls. They're so beautiful. Um, and they all live on a huge compound. He bought a bunch of land. There's all these houses. And so my cousin Kristen and Ross and Marshall and everyone lived in a different house on the same piece of land with a river running through it. It's so gorgeous. What was going on with your dad in retrospect and, and talking with Kevin or Kathy, his former wife, where he was at when he decided that he would take his life after he had had all the warrants? Well, you know, he was writing scripts. We got arrested with Daddy this. a lot. Remember how you mentioned Chris Adams? Yeah. The last time he got arrested was right outside of Chris Adams' house with us. Um, so we always got split up. This always happened, literally. <laughs> like, so we all get arrested together. It was me, my dad, and my sister. So my dad would go in one car. Me and my sister were in another car. We'd be banging on the door, cussing at the cops, flicking them off. That's what we did. We were so little, too, or like six-year-old little girls. Anyway, and we'd go into uh, the sheriff's office and color. And we could see all the monitors. And Daddy knew we could see him on the monitors. He still would make it funny. He'd be making faces at the monitors, mooning the monitors, everything, because he knew we could see them. And so it ended up making us laugh. And Annie would come pick us up. We'd wake up somewhere strange the next day. So anyway, we knew something was coming, right? So they told him, he sold cocaine a lot, right? So they told, yeah. So they said, the judge said, the next time I see you in here, you're going to prison. So he got arrested again. He knew he was going to prison. All his brothers died except one. And me and my sister were taken away from him. And we were very close. So I don't blame him. I just don't. I just, I don't know what I would do. You know, the thing uh, that was really so strange about that, and throughout my career in North Texas, you know, I would be listening to the radio and I'd hear, okay, Gino had left. Gino died. You know, uh, David died. Uh, you know, all happened. these guys, I always kept hearing this on the radio. And then when, when I look back, because now, you know, it's 2017, I'm 52. You know, I was there in Dallas and then 86, 87 in Denton and then breaking into business in 89, 90. Then I went on to Tennessee and then WCW and then throughout my career. But when I look at everything that Kerry accomplished, when he shot himself, when he committed suicide, he was 33 years old old he was still a baby but he was on he, he was this global superstar that everybody looked up to i thought he'd been around for 20 years because i had grown up with the von erics and i thought man when i started doing the timeline i was thinking you know carrie was probably 40 when he committed suicide no he was 33 and, and it's just unbelievable that he accomplished so much they were such a huge impact on everybody in Texas and then really around the world because of the way their TV was bootlegged. And I was certainly a hero that I looked up to, and I couldn't believe that he had left this world at 33 years of age. That is so young. Because he had lived the life that he had to me, when, when I look back at it, and I didn't process it this way back when, when, I, when it happened, it was like, man, he was such a, he was an old soul and a young body. And he, when, he, when he had his run in WWE, WWF at the time, he looked like he was 38, you know, but, and just because of my perception of him, that he'd been around for so long, I just had him being that old. The guy hadn't really reached his peak years as far as what we normally would do inside the squared circle. So, I don't know, it's a weird conversation because I can see your eyes tearing up as we're talking. And I was watching uh, Bill Mercer talk about this on the... Uh, I was watching on the WWE Network, the rise and fall of world, world-class championship wrestling. It brought a tear to my eye to, to look at, you know, Kevin, you know, wrapping the thing up, saying, like, you know, people think that I've had a tough life. He goes, I've had a great life. He goes, all my friends and all my brothers are gone, but, you know, we got to spend 25 he years together. always so positive, though. Like, I grew up at their house, and Uncle Kevin – was so happy and positive throughout my whole childhood. He's very, he's very much a hippie. I know he wouldn't call himself. He's absolutely a hundred percent a hippie. Doesn't like to wear shoes. Only wears shirts with holes in them. Slides his feet everywhere he goes because he's had so many knee surgeries. 
and is always has a happy smile and like loves nature and like he always showers if it's raining outside. He he goes outside to shower because he loves the rain. He spear fishes all the time in Hawaii. He's just he's just one with nature. He's one with himself. He's just very much content with life and how things are supposed to happen. And he's very spiritual and. Yeah, with he doesn't have the mentality my other uncles had in life and everything else. He had, he's learned to cope with it by just being so like just calm. And I mean, a lot of people could learn from that. It's even me. I mean, I just sometimes the way the way he phrases things is like, man, that's an interesting way to look at it. That's an interesting perspective. He he just has some some. I, I should have written some of them down. Just the the way that he thinks. I don't know. He just. He's like that guy that you would go to who's been through it all to ask for some advice because, well, he has been through it all. Yeah, yeah. When I told him that uh, me and Brooke Hogan and Ariel and Brittany Page and stuff was thinking about starting an all-girls wrestling federation, he was like, baby girl, that's what he always called me, are you sure you want to get back in this business? <laughs> <laughs> the all-girl wrestling federation, is that still... On the books, well, Brooke still Hogan actually texted me before while I was on the way here. I said, "What? What kind of tell them about it? Because a lot of it's a secret." We're working hard on getting the girls a platform. That's our our girls. We're finalizing who's going to be in the league and deciding what kind of live shows we're going to be doing. Possibly a tour, um, house shows, and in one spot. It's all going to be girls, and then all the owners are me and Brooke Hogan, Ariel Piper, and. Brittany Page, or the Daughters of Wrestling. We've been in it our whole life. I'm the only one that's actually wrestled, so I'll be helping train the girls. I want to bring everything back to how it used to be, like when my dad and stuff, and when they started wrestling, right? Not how it is now with the girls. I think they look too um, choreographed. I want it to be, I want them to get hurt, <laughs> you know? Like, I don't want to. I don't want them to hold back. They're gonna hurt a little bit, but they'll be okay. I mean, I want Ronda Rousey to come in and and show them how real wrestling is, and then we'll just, you know, we'll just kind of back it off just a little bit. When when you say about you know women's wrestling today, what well, the business has changed. Man, mm -hmm. the, the the girls these days are they're, they're, they're kicking ass pretty damn good. Yeah. When I think of the well, the, I don't watch it. Maybe I should watch it. You got to watch it. I mean, the, the the women in WWE have taken it to another level. But oh, really? When you talk about a physical, how long have you not been watching? I think I was just oh back at TNA when I was at TNA. Oh, you know what? But that was a whole generation removed from what's going on today. Oh, gotcha. Yeah. So if you tune back in, they've really taken it to a, an unbelievable level of athleticism and stuff that they're they're, they, they're, they're doing. Heard, so I'm obsessed with American Ninja Warrior. And I heard that one of the girls, I forget her name. Casey. I'll mess Casey. up her last name, Cataronzo. Yes. She's amazing. Yes, she was so on that, my show. I'm going to start tweeting it because she's my favorite girl on American Ninja Warrior. And so. They've really taken it to a crazy level. And they're, they're really done awesome. But, you know, when I think back and, uh, you know, I was listening to Kevin talk about the physicality of the Freebirds and the Von Erics. Those guys were beating the shit out of each other. And it's like they were saying in the interview, we tried to not knock each other's teeth out, not break any bones, but other than that, it was pretty much fair game. That's kind of what I want the girls to do. Well, that'd be great. That'd be great. Uh, I'm but, not but, wrestling, so. <laughs> but that's what, but that's, and, but, and, and that's what Kevin was saying. You know, he goes, hey, I laid my stuff, and I work snug. Some people would say stiff, which kind of way I, I like to work as well. I like stiff. But they were beating the hell out of each other, and that, that was part of the thing that was so on fire. Again, when I was around in the sport tournament, it started tapering off, and then 89-90, it was starting to die in that neck of the woods. But, man, that action in world-class championship wrestling, you know, when all the Von Erics were really running strong, was super physical. I mean, if you'd have told somebody it was fake, they'd have said, you're shitting me, that this ain't real, because you thought it was. Well, pretty much was, right? When you get baseball slid out, you do. When you get slapped, you do. I, I ask the girls sometimes, you just lay it on a little harder. Don't, don't, if you don't hit me, I'm not going to, I'm not going to sell it. I'm not. Because it looks like shit. And it makes me look like shit if I fall down for your crap. And they didn't like that. But I was like, I'm a Von Eric. I can't just come out here and then just do this shit. 
And I felt like that at TNA. Even though I loved TNA so much, I did feel like my dumbass character and the way I had to wrestle sucked. And honestly, with this league, I want redemption. But now, do you do you think it was because at 21 years of age, I mean, you're a baby. I mean, you're still you're a young lady. 31 is still a very young person. But at 21, you might not have been as serious as you needed to have been or maybe able to grasp the situation in hand. Do you think with now, maybe at a more mature level, at yeah, 31, a different mindset that you would approach the business differently? Absolutely, yes, of course. I approach all of life differently. So, yeah. <laughs> and, you know, like, like I always say, man, if I could go back and do it again, knowing what I know now, God dang, I'd have been a whole lot better. So I guess that's true from anyone's perspective. Yeah, I guess so. with, with, with experience, any age comes wisdom, but you have to be able to soak it up and use it. So I did okay, but if I could go back and do it, knowing what I know now, You're I probably could have achieved a higher level. <laughs> But, you know, <laughs> but at 21, you know, I think you went in. and You were I mean, my favorite character. You know how bad I wanted to smash beers and drink beer while they think they wouldn't let me. <laughs> you know what? It was so much fun, you know, going down to the sportatorium back in the day and watching those guys and then, you know, end up training in that ring in the sportatorium and then making my debut. And then it took me, you know, years to really get a handle on everything. And then for a while, you know, I wanted to be Ric Flair because I thought Ric Flair was like the greatest wrestler as far as wrestling goes, and I tried to emulate his style. It didn't work out so well for me. And then it took getting dropped on my head, changing my style, coming up with the final gimmick. Everything is kind of a work in process, and everything is you know a transition period, and you have to be willing to experiment, and I was, and to finally come up with the Stone Cold character that I created. But, yeah, it, it, it didn't happen overnight for me. Right. But it, it was funny because I got a chance to kind of watch – you know, your dad and all the brothers just kind of like, like Kevin was saying, everybody had a gimmick. Our gimmick was we weren't a gimmick. We were, you know, the Von Eric boys. Mm -hmm. And not being, a, not being a gimmick or not having a gimmick was the gimmick. They just were themselves. And they that, asked me. That's why Texas and America me, fell in love with them. What were you in wrestling? I was like, Lacey Von Eric. <laughs> I go, what? <laughs> I didn't really, I mean, I did the beautiful people or whatever, but I don't know. You want to hear my Ric Flair story? Yeah. Okay, here, it starts with a scar. You see this horrible scar right here? Oh, the one you buy yourself? Yeah. Yeah. That's horrible. Yeah, you know why? Okay, so we're in, we're in uh, Australia. I'm on the Hulkamania tour. I did a swimsuit like thing one night and whatever, but I had too many fans there and they were like, you got to be in the main show with Ric Flair and Hulk Hogan. Or Rick and Hogan actually came up to me and said, hey, you got to be in the show with us. I said, okay. So I was Ric Flair's manager. And so, because they wanted to be controversial because the Von Eric and Flair had like this rivalry. Now I was with Ric Flair, so we were the bad guys. Yeah. Right? Anyway, we did the same spot every night. It was 10 days in Australia, Sydney, Melbourne, um, Brisbane, and Perth. Same spot every night. Rick grabs my arm, pulls me in front of him, pushes me in front of Hogan. I bear hug him. He punches him in the face, right? So... Rick keeps his blade on his middle finger and never has a manager. <laughs> Hogan keeps his in his mouth, which is ridiculous. How do you even talk? I, I don't get it. So Rick grabs me and pulls me in front of him. I look, I, and I bear hug Hogan, right? I look to my right, and blood is squirting like a waterfall out of my arm. And I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> and... Uh, and Hogan, he's like, it's okay, baby, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> so it's the beginning of the show in front of 20,000 people. And then I have to, like, climb up on the second rope, mouth of the south, Jimmy Hart comes and pulls my dress down. I just have lingerie. I have to jump into the ring and headlock Hogan. And so we're down on the ground. They've already gigged the shit out of themselves, so they're completely bloody everywhere. I'm bleeding. And all I say to Hogan, like, as I'm as I'm headlocking him is, you better not have AIDS. You better not have AIDS. <laughs> and he's like, I don't, baby. I don't. <laughs> and the whole Hogan, no, baby. Oh, no, baby. <laughs> yeah, no, baby. I don't. So then I run backstage when it's all done, and I go over to the ambulance, and I'm like, can you fix me up? And they were like, oh, we're fake. They didn't even have a Band-Aid. <laughs> they were fake for the show. <laughs> So I get my sweatshirt and I tie my arm up and I go back to the hotel and I'm like, do y'all have like band-aids or anything? And so they have band-aids. So I take the ends of band-aids, cut them and had to butterfly myself up. And that's why you have the hideous scar on your right bicep. 
I love that scar. Even, it's a great story to get a scar. Even Rick said, I will get you plastic surgery fixed. I was like, are you kidding me? This is the best scar I have. Well, you're talking about two of the biggest names in the history of wrestling. If you're working with Hogan and Flair and you get a scar <laughs> of the deal, yeah, it's kind of a win. Yeah. And then here's I get my, to bring up the story when everyone sees it. Well, here's my Flair <laughs> story. It was right before I walked out of the company because I didn't want to uh, do this program with Brock Lesnar because they wanted to beat me on TV with no buildup. And there was amazing money to be made there and a bit of amazing pay-per-view. And I love Brock Lesnar. I was running hard, not making great decisions. And I got the creative call and I didn't like it. And so I was going to call Vince that night. So this was in Columbus, Georgia on a Sunday. And I'm working with the one and only Ric Flair in a cage that night. And we're working Monday Night Raw in Atlanta the next day. That's the Raw I would no-show. So anyway, back to the match. Back to the story with Flair. Back to the razor blade on the middle finger. We're having a match. You know, I just told Rick, hey, man, call it in the ring. Because I don't hear very well, so I call 99% of my matches. And I just, I'm in Rick's hands, so I'm going to listen to the greatest of all time. <laughs> and I'm going to have fun. And we're having a blast. And we're in a cage. And all of a sudden, that tape comes off. And I'm bleeding. I got uh, from my arms, from my chest. He scratched you that much? Yeah, he scratched oh the shit God. out of me. I thought I got in a fight with the damn alley cat. Oh, no. But it's Ric Flair, so who really gives a shit? Oh, no. It was great. I had a blast. And then, Do you, you have know, scars from that? No, just little bitty scars. Did it did like, get you deep like me? Oh, no, it didn't get me deep, but I had to just little <laughs> spots of blood everywhere. I'm like, God damn, it's like working with Edward Scissorhands over here. No. So glad someone else experienced it. <laughs> you had to hear the story when they did. Um, let's go back to the David Von Erich Memorial uh, match where Kerry won the title from Nature Boy Ric Flair. And this was, you know, in memory of David. That was stadium. Yeah. About 40 or 50,000 people show up. Have you seen the match back on YouTube? No. Oh, yes. And I, and I have the pictures on my phone of Daddy backstage because uh, I used to look at him all the time. But, yeah, it's amazing. Man, all these fans, they know, they remember these amazing matches. They remember these things about Daddy. And I'm like, my story of Daddy is not matches. And we hated wrestling. We hated him wrestling. We cry every time. But what did you want him to do? It was kayfabe, by the way. Right. He didn't even tell my mom or us that it wasn't real. <laughs> like, we were crying our eyes out all the time. And we were always in the hospital because Daddy would get the same spot in his eyebrow every freaking time. So he's constantly getting stitches. So we're always going to the hospital afterwards. It's like, why do you do this? <laughs> like, to us, he was always losing. <laughs> so. What do you spend your days doing now? Because I hear you're ahead of the PTA. I know you have three wonderful kids. <laughs> like, how do you occupy your day uh, if you're not getting this wrestling thing going uh, with the women? Right. And you're living out in Westlake Village. How do you occupy your time, and what are you interesting and pursuing? Because Jesus, like you said, you're you're only a pup. You're 31 years old. Thank you. Well, I've been with my husband 10 years. Got my three kids. Got a ton of pets. I wake up every morning. I go to boot camp, and then I'm home by 6:30 in the morning after boot camp, and I uh, feed all my pets. I'm the room moms for both their classes. Like, so anything the classes need for school, I'm the PTA mom, so I do everything for the school and run their fundraisers every month, and uh, shop a <laughs> lot. And uh, Give me that look. <laughs> a little too much shopping. I mean, honestly, whenever Brooke and them called me about doing a wrestling federation, I'm like, when am I going to tr- do that? But then I was like, you know what, I am really young, and I am spending all my time just you know, finding ways to get in the kids' lives and and always be in their class. And I'm the managers for all of their teams and everything. I do everything. And so I think it'll be fun to shake it up a little bit. I'm the epitome of a separate mom right now. <laughs> Is that good? I love it. Give me a happy story because there was so much tragedy with with y'all's family. But give me a, give me a happy story. With Daddy? Or, yeah, or anything that brings a smile to your face. My dad used to always sing, this is a song that never ends. It goes on and on, my friends. And be really annoying and do that for an hour. That was really fun. Um, he was a really bad cook, so he would burn everything. So we'd always come back to his apartment with it black and with no alarms going off. And that was fun. It actually was fun. All these bad things that would happen when he'd take us out of school and he'd kidnap us. That was the most fun thing ever. 
he would he would sneak in our beds and say, "Come on, girls!" So we'd go and we'd have the best time in the car. We'd go to Aunt Pam and Uncle Kevin's house and play with all my cousins. Me and my cousins used to go outside and mud wrestle. We loved mud wrestling, uh, and so we, and then we'd run through the house. My Aunt Pam would chase us. Um, no, I have great memories. Most of the best memories I have in my life are at Aunt Pam and Uncle Kevin's house, and they know that. They're my they're my happiest part of my life. All right, everybody, give me the go-home cue. It's time to wrap up this podcast and ride off in the sunset. Before I do that, I want to thank my guest, Lacey Von Eric, for coming over to 317 Gimmick Street. If you guys want something to watch, go to the WWE Network and log in and watch Triumph and Tragedy, the rise and fall of world-class championship wrestling to get an up-close and personal look at that entire territory, some of the uh, characters and personalities that came in there and lit that place up. Good interviews there by Gary Hart talking about various talents and some of the things that were going on there. Uh, I watched this thing. It's probably about the third time I've watched it. It's just a great documentary and talking about the good old days. And uh, uh, that, that territory was near and dear to my heart because, you know, that's what I was feeding off of in those college days. So check that out. I think you really will enjoy that. And, you know, before I start talking about ProWrestlingTees.com and all the T-shirts I'm going to be wearing on this season's Broken Skull Challenge, let me talk about that. That season premiere is Tuesday, September 26, 10, 9 p.m. on CMT. We kick off the damnedest season I've ever filmed out there. It's season five, and I give a shout-out to all the athletes, the men and women that came out there and put it on the line this year. We made things bigger, badder, tougher, harder than ever before. And it's one thing to go out there and, and just be in shape, but when we put your ass out on a mountain in the middle of a desert and put these challenges in front of you, and I'm there offering you motivation on top of what you have to do, it's just pretty damn epic. So I'm real proud of this season, and I, you know, I don't brag about too many things I've done, but I'm real proud of this season and how it plays out. Just some spectacular triumphs, and there's a lot of <laughs> there's some tragedies out there. To steal a note off that uh, World Class Championship wrestling dvd or special on the network but anyway all the shirts that i have we're going to release one tomorrow finally pro com slash steve austin that's where you can find all those shirts and if you're thirsty go check out the best damn ipa on the planet it's broken skull ipa from el segundo brewing company and you can find it at uh, whole foods and total wines if you live in california if you don't live in cali check inside the seller.com and see if they ship to your state and hey man I tell everybody, if you're looking for a damn knife, you got to have one. Everybody should have one. Then you need to check into the uh, Cold Steel Broken Skull Knife or the new Working Man Knife, and you can get them at my new Amazon store. Amazon has the best price on both knives. Just go to Amazon.com forward slash shop forward slash Steve Austin. I want to say one more thank you to all the fine sponsors of the Steve Austin Show. That's how I'm able to do this podcast for you twice a week for free. And you can find all my sponsors at podcastone.com. Just click on the Killer Deals button at the top of that page and then click on the Steve Austin Show banner. And speaking of Podcast One, the new Podcast One app is now available for download at the App Store or Google Play. And there ain't another podcast app like this one anywhere. And that's because the new Podcast One app is loaded with some cool features that lets you do a lot more than just listen to your favorite shows. You can access behind-the-scenes photos, articles, and connect with other fans of the shows you like. And you can watch over 1,000 360 virtual reality videos. And you can actually watch some of your favorite shows in virtual reality. And it's just like you're sitting in the same room with them. So get to the App Store or Google Play and download the new Podcast One app now. Hey, man, if you want to check me out on social media, you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Steve Austin BSR. Before I sign off, I want to say uh, give a shout out to all those people down there in Florida, uh, Hurricane Irma really just tore through there and the wind got a lot of people but that damn water i've been reading about all the the havoc and the hassles and the heartbreak down there with so much water down there in florida and we knew it was going to be bad and so much of that standing water man i'm reading about people getting infections and just just the craziest stuff that you wouldn't expect to happen and then uh, all the mosquitoes uh, over there from Hurricane Harvey. They're probably going to have the same things down in Irma. That whole uh, Hurricane Harvey area, a lot of that's still underwater. Some of it's back up and functioning. But both these storms are going to take a long time to recover from both of these. And, and, you know, it seems like there's some coverage in the news about, you know, all the people down there in Florida. And I've got a lot of close friends, uh, very close friends uh, down in that Florida area that I've been in contact with and of course there in the Houston area as well 
and their lives are changed because of this and they're trying to make the most of it but sometimes you just don't see it often enough on television they're talking about all this you know there's a lot of silly shit going on out there but both of those regions down there in florida down there in texas still trying to recover and have a long way to go so uh, my thoughts are with you my thoughts with all them animals out there and i hope everything uh, dries out and things try to get back to normal so many people have lost loved ones everything they got it's been a real tough situation down there so while i'm up out here in los angeles california my thoughts are with everybody down there fighting a struggle and trying to return back to a normal life folks until next time my name is steve austin and i will catch your ass down the road this has been a podcast one production download new episodes of the steve austin show every tuesday at podcast one.com that's podcast one.com you're listening to love advice with leanne caller you're on the air uh, hi, Leanne. Long-time listener, first-time caller. <laughs> Why, in your professional opinion, do you never take my calls off the air? Is this Carl? Yep, it's Carl. I mean, we had a few dates. Everything was great, I thought. Uh... Well, you know, when you switch to GEICO, you could save a lot of money on car insurance. Okay, awesome. You should call them. I will. GEICO, because saving 15% or more on car insurance is always a great answer. Okay, Kevin, for the grand prize of $1 million, what color is the White House? Um... 